For more on that now, we can talk to Michael uh, Bossacu, Global Affairs Analyst and Senior Fellow at the Atlantic Council. You're in Lviv. Thank you for talking to us today on uh, France 24. First of all, tell us uh, what you can say about what you have witnessed of the conflict where you are. Well, um, thank you for having me. Um, well, the past uh, actually 12 to 15 hours have been very difficult here in Lviv because we've had about four separate air raid siren alarms. And even though, you know, the people are starting to get used to these, uh, when they happen in the middle of the night, or even they, they, when they happen in business hours, businesses close down, people go into bomb shelters. And, you know, it's only a few days ago, which we had uh, a, a very serious missile strike here. So anxiety is very, very high. And don't forget, you have about almost a quarter of a million internally displaced people here, as well as a lot of humanitarian aid workers. So it's a situation where you never know what might happen next. It does seem calm outside, but on the other hand, uh, underneath the surface, uh, a lot of anxiety. Now, tell us a little bit more about this aid conference, this humanitarian conference being organised uh, in Warsaw. It's very unusual, isn't it, for uh, Europe to come together in this manner. But of course, it's also quite un unusual for war uh, to take place again on the European continent. Uh, tell us about, about this conference and the uh, sure. unusual nature of it. Yeah, well, it's great to see. I mean, Europe had a hard time coming together uh, in terms of COVID-19 protocols like trade and travel restrictions, but they seemed very um, uh, supportive and unanimous. Now I watch part of it live and big amounts are being pledged. So and this is now the time actually for people to start talking about the reconstruction of Ukraine. Having said that, um, there, you know, uh, before uh, the uh, before hostilities started here in Ukraine, there was another war in Ukraine, and that was the war on corruption. That has more or less been suspended right now, but I think the donors have to keep that in mind. So when you have this flow of money into the country pretty much all at once, there will be some checks and balances installed to make sure it's spent efficiently and properly. And for that, perhaps they might consider a kind of um, donor czar that could help administer these funds. Because, you know, any country developed, underdeveloped, if you throw a lot of money at, the, at once, there is a problem that we call the aid business um, absorbed of capacity. So that's why they're going to need a lot of help. But on a last point is I think the West would do Ukraine a favor by insisting that as soon as possible, the war on corruption resume uh, judicial reform, for example, and also th basic things like government salaries. Average salaries here are about 480 euros a month. That's not very much, and that opens the way to corruption when those salaries are paid in government. Okay, and and you you mentioned there the the I suppose the corruption issues in Ukraine. I suppose will will some of these funds be put on ice until we know the outcome of the war and to what extent the country might be partitioned? I well, mean, these no funds won't be going to Russia, for yeah. example, right? Right. Yeah, no one's talking about partitioning quite yet. But um, yeah, I think, you know, the best thing is a phase approach. And what you need to do is in any humanitarian response, for example, is you need experts to come in here and do assessments of what's needed. For example, small and medium sized businesses, which make up a big, big part of the Ukrainian economy, are going to need a lot of help. Even though businesses, for example, here in Lviv uh, are thriving because of all the displaced people here, Kiev, uh, Kharkiv, places like that, they're on their knees. They're gasping uh, for breath. Uh, the media sector, for example, I talked to the executive of one of the biggest TV channels here. The advertising market has completely collapsed. They're going to be out of money by the end of October. So it has to be done sector by sector to identify who needs what and how can they best be helped. OK, and just going back to the to the conflict itself uh, in Ukraine, um, what would you say of the risk of this of this confrontation really reaching another level of uh, uh, of serious uh, seriousness, for want of a, a better word? We've heard uh, several yeah. um, people coming from, from from the UK and elsewhere saying about how all of Ukraine should be retaken, including Crimea. Uh, to what extent does that risk really uh, being a red flag to a bull in terms of uh, antagonising Russia? How far can this be pushed without it not uh, flowing over into the, the, the horrible spectre of a nuclear sure. war? Yeah, it's a very, very big legitimate concern, you know, and uh, the Russian playbook is if it's backed into a corner, how does it respond? It responds with carpet bombing, 
with long range cruise missiles like the ones that hit here the other day. So um, that's what I'm afraid of is they're not doing very well, as your previous guest, um, your colleague said um, on the battlefield. But that's what they have in their reserve are those long range weapons, which, by the way, often are not very accurate. So they tend to go into civilian neighborhoods as well. And that's why I have said, Ukrainian government has said, no inch of Ukraine is safe until its skies can be protected. And that's why President Zelensky is begging for more sophisticated weaponry to help close those skies. you, you, you speak about those large weapons. You speak about sophisticated weaponry, but we've seen uh, Russian strikes on uh, those weapons as they've been arriving in towards the west of the country. Uh, could, was that not obviously going to take place? That Russia was going to take uh, take aim at these weapons as they arrive into the country? Yeah, and that's something uh, Western military logistics people have to start thinking about if they haven't already, because. Um, you know, the rail Rhine is the primary uh, transport mechanism for those weapons, for the weapons, uh, aside from cargo and agriculture and people. So um, this is a big fear. The, the, a lot of those lines are shared with uh, people, uh, migrants uh, fleeing the conflict. So uh, these strikes also do collateral damage in the, you know, in terms of what we had here in Lviv the other day. They knock power out, water, internet, that sort of thing. Uh, I hope that this does not continue because, um, again, these infrastructure locations that have been targeted are very close to densely populated areas. But having said that, I mean, I've been to Donetsk many times and what we saw there was heavy, heavy Russian shelling into populated areas. So they have no qualms about it. And um, we're getting into a very complex, uh, difficult area right now. Michael Barsarkiw, thank you for those thoughts uh, and that analysis from uh, Lviv.